All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Richard Goldberg, a senior advisor at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, join us to discuss the state of Iran's nuclear program. Mr. Goldberg will be speaking for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Richard Goldberg. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Thank you for everybody who's uh, tuned in uh, at this lunch hour uh, on a Friday to, uh, to talk about this very important issue. Uh, I think for some level setting, maybe talk about where we've come from over the last nine months and then to be able to lead up to where we are going uh, today potentially. When Iran entered uh, 2021, uh, it was not uh, looking at a very bright future. In fact, according to the International Monetary Fund, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran was down to just $4 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves at the end of 2020 due to the impact of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration. Uh, what we have seen uh, since then uh, with the Biden administration coming in is a loosening uh, of that pressure campaign. Uh, Mr. Biden came in with the campaign pledge that he was going to go back to the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal's formal name back in 2015. Uh, and he would offer to lift sanctions on Iran uh, in exchange for Iran coming back into compliance with that nuclear deal. Uh, they believed, the, this administration, that going back to this deal, despite its many flaws that we've all talked about for years, despite its already uh, expiring uh, clauses called sunset provisions that already started last fall and continue in the next few years, uh, that it would provide some sort of a basis to negotiate a longer and stronger deal. Uh, importantly, I think uh, also, uh, as, as this administration had taken over in January, uh, two other elements, uh, obviously, of a maximum pressure campaign. One was economic, we've talked about. Uh, one was political in nature. Uh, that is it within international organizations uh, holding Iran accountable for its violations of, of different treaties and commitments. Most particularly, we look at the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, the UN's nuclear watchdog based in Vienna. Uh, for several years now, since uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu revealed to the world back in 2018 that the Mossad had captured uh, parts of a secret nuclear weapons archive that the Iranians had hid from us, during JCPOA negotiations, there has been an ongoing investigation that has led the uh, IAEA, according to its director general, to find at least four uh, sites that were previously unknown uh, to the IAEA, uh, where at at least three of those sites, the IAEA has found samples of uranium that have tested positive. Uh, with no answers from the Iranians, what were these sites, what was being stored at these sites, and where is the material or equipment or anything else that was there uh, now today? We saw back uh, at the UN General Assembly in 2018 when Netanyahu uh, showed uh, and revealed that there was some sort of a warehouse uh, where things were being stored. We then saw some commercial imagery of containers and then the containers were gone and sanitization work going on at this warehouse. Uh, some media reports have attributed that site to be called something like Turkuzabad. Uh, today, we don't know what was at that site. Uh, we know from the IAEA, uh, presumably when you put the pieces together, uh, that they have visited a site uh, like that, that they have found evidence of uranium being there. They have apparently gone to other sites as well where they have found the presence of particles of uranium. No answers today of what Iran has not declared. But remind, remember that this is in fact already a breach, not of the JCPOA, but of Iran's fundamental obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and its Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement that it has signed long ago with the IAEA to declare the presence of all nuclear material and sites where that nuclear material is being processed. Its failure to have a complete declaration of its nuclear program to the IAEA is a violation, is a breach of the NPT, and is really underlying to show us a nuclear deceit that really informs uh, the weakness of the JCPOA built upon it. Uh, it's impossible to have assurances and verification of a nuclear program lacking complete declarations of that nuclear program. 
And we know the flaws of the JCPOA. Not only did they clearly not know there was a secret nuclear weapons archive or several sites that may have contained nuclear activities. And today we still don't know using the JCPOA's tools where different nuclear material or activities uh, are today. But we also have known that the IAEA does not have any access to military sites, nor does it have any access to sites controlled by an organization called the SPND, which has long been engaged in the clandestine work of nuclear weapons. And we saw its, uh, its head, the former founder of Iran's nuclear weapons program, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, assassinated uh, just last year. We move forward as well in the military realm, deterrence. Obviously, if Iran does not believe there is a credible threat uh, of military action uh, from the United States or other countries to deter its aggression in the region, to deter its quest for nuclear weapons, then Iran will feel free to go forward across what we have previously believed might be red lines for the international community. That is true in the nuclear realm. It's also true in the realm of terrorism and asymmetric warfare. Under the Trump administration, that sense of deterrence was finally restored after the killing of Qasem Soleimani. And so we saw that while the Iranians uh, were incrementally expanding their nuclear program during the Trump years to try to gain back some sort of leverage to create political pressure on the Trump administration to back down from the maximum pressure campaign, they never went far enough to provoke the Europeans, uh, for example, to uh, embrace the snapback of UN sanctions at the Security Council to collapse the JCPOA. They never went far enough to really prompt discussions of military action. All of that changed as we started transitioning from President Trump to President Biden with a pledge to go back to the nuclear deal. And it really was, if you look, starting in early mid-January, once the Iranians felt comfortable and, and secure that Donald Trump was leaving office and was politically constrained from taking any sort of military action. They crossed the Rubicon and started to enrich uh, up to 20% uh, level of purity, something that had long ago been viewed uh, as uh, very alarming to the international community and something that would prompt uh, US and allies to go all in at the Security Council to reimpose sanctions uh, on Iran. That didn't happen. In fact, once uh, the Biden administration took office, it was very much a pullback on every single one of these lines of effort of pressure, and in fact, a transition from maximum pressure to maximum deference to try to give room, give breathing room to the Iranian regime to encourage it to come back to a negotiating table and come back to the JCPOA. In the economic realm, sanctions stop being enforced. They're on the books today, but they're not being enforced. And we saw Chinese imports of Iranian oil skyrocket, revenue going up. And it wasn't just the non-enforcement of sanctions, which of course is itself sanctions relief, but it was also actual sanctions relief, granting uh, waivers uh, sent to Congress by this administration to allow the Iranians access to billions of dollars of previously inaccessible foreign exchange reserves to use that locked up money overseas to pay off foreign debt. And we saw that happen in South Korea, Japan, potentially elsewhere. In the political realm, when the Iranians had crossed to the 20% rich uranium and were blocking all further investigation into these undeclared nuclear sites and materials, you would have thought that the first quarterly board meeting of the IAEA of 2021 would look very similar to its previous board meetings from 2020, where in fact on the Trump administration in June 2020, the IAEA board adopted a censure resolution of Iran. Uh, both for its nuclear misconduct uh, on its uh, uh, breach uh, potentially of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, non-cooperation with the IAEA, but also sending a message on its general nuclear misconduct and deceit. In March, the Europeans were actually poised to go forward with another censure resolution. But in fact, the Biden administration, uh, wanting to try to show this deference to Tehran, pulled them back uh, and said, no, let's not do any resolutions at this board meeting. And there was none. What did we see in response? The Iranians uh, increased uh, their enrichment to 60%, once believed to be a true red line that they would not cross. But in fact, now they are enriching all the way up to 60%. Again, uh, we went into a June board meeting. The, uh, Trump, the Biden administration said, no, let's not do any censure resolutions. What did we see in response? The, the Iranians have expanded their stockpiles and started to enrich, uh, started to uh, produce uh, 20% uh, enriched 
uh, uranium metal, again, components that could be used in nuclear weapons. And uh, they started taking uh, different elements of, of the IAEA verification program hostage, not allowing the IAEA to access videotapes, not allowing them into certain sites. And so things have quickly deteriorated as the economic pressure went away, as the political pressure went away, and then in the military realm, also deterrence going, going far, far away. Uh, remember that uh, in response to attacks on US troops and the killing uh, of a US contractor, Ultimately, Qasem Soleimani, uh, who was continuing to plot against Americans, American interests, was killed by the Trump administration. We have seen countless attacks carried out at the direction of Tehran this year against U.S. forces in Iraq and now in Syria against U.S. allies in the Gulf without almost any response militarily from the Biden administration. Uh, we just saw a couple in the last couple of weeks, the UAV uh, attack on troops in Syria, no military response that we know of to date. We saw attacks in Western Iraq that actually led to the death of a US contractor in March, no military response to that attack whatsoever, even with the death of a US contractor. And that has consequences that again, with pulling back on the economic pressure, the political pressure and the military pressure has led to where we are today, which is a very emboldened uh, dictatorship that went through a transition to a new president, very outwardly uh, revolutionary, recommitting itself to the fundamental ideals of the Islamic Revolution and the Islamic Republic, filling its cabinet with a who's who of Iran Terror Inc. And basically saying, you wanna give us money while we continue to forge ahead with our nuclear program and take control of the region and start moving in uh, despite the rollback we had experienced over the last couple of years in the last administration go right ahead and do it, but know who you're giving money to. And so we now see that, that we're coming up upon uh, the last quarterly board meeting of the IAEA in Vienna towards the end of this month. And suddenly out of the blue, the Iranians have decided we're willing to come back to indirect negotiations in Vienna to discuss the potential of whether we would go back to the JCPOA or something like it. We'll get back to that in one moment. It'll be my final point. Uh, and, and that's going to take place the week after that quarterly board meeting of the IAEA, which of course is a setup uh, for those who uh, want to keep pulling pressure back on Iran to say, no, no, we can't do a censure resolution at this quarterly board meeting, despite all of the escalations this entire year and expansions of Iran's nuclear program, the taking hostage of different elements of the IAEA's inspections regime their non-cooperation on a breach of the NPT and an investigation into where are these nuclear sites, where are these nuclear materials, where does all this come from? Well, we can't do that because it could jeopardize the talks next week uh, in Vienna. And so it, it, we'll see what happens. There's a choice before the Biden administration right now, whether or not uh, to change direction in their policy. And that choice uh, will be whether or not to push forward a censure resolution of Iran at this board meeting in November. And it's not just about its enrichment of uranium, remember. It's not just about its violation of its JCPOA commitments, which is what you will see in most media coverage. The Biden administration has completely stopped talking about the separate NPT investigation into those sites and nuclear activities. And remember, you can go back to JCPOA, you can love JCPOA, it means nothing if Iran is concealing its clandestine nuclear activities. It is a phony deal built on fraud. And then we'll see what happens next as well, as far as any sort of pressure campaign. Uh, will there be a return to some sort of multilateral pressure uh, if Iran continues to drag its heels uh, and does not uh, agree to go back to the JCPOA as the Biden administration has said it wants to? More likely, unfortunately, the uh, administration is going to position itself with the Iranians for something else, something less, something even worse than JCPOA offering sanctions relief of some kind. They'll call it limited sanctions relief, partial sanctions relief. But remember in sanctions relief, there's no partial. It's like taking a pin to a balloon, you know, that has built up all that air inside and saying, well, we're only partially gonna pop the balloon. That's not how sanctions work. When you offer partial sanctions relief, you're offering sanctions relief. And in exchange, Iran will try to capture and, and regain and take a lot of its nuclear gains to date and renegotiate a much worse deal where it sets a new baseline for its nuclear program going forward and still gets additional economic relief from where it's at today. That's a very dangerous prospect before us. What can people do about it? Well, Congress is already doing something. We've seen Republicans in Congress speak out 
uh, leaders, uh, those who may be running for president, saying very clearly to the Iranians who are asking for some guarantee from President Biden that the United States will never leave the Iran deal again or any other deal in the future again, will not reimpose sanctions ever again, that unless we actually see true behavioral change, that the nuclear program has been dismantled, that terrorism has been halted, that this is a different regime that is acting differently and behaving like a normal country, you can guarantee one thing, sanctions will be back the minute Congress has the votes or there's a new president. That's an important message to send, not just to the Iranians, but to the private sector that might be tempted to go back into Iran should sanctions be lifted. There are things states can do, governors, state legislatures, to expand their laws uh, beyond uh, some of the divestment laws we saw in the uh, mid-2000s uh, to ban state uh, contracts and state investment in companies that do business with any sector of Iran that's tied to the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And there's also just messaging that needs to happen to the banking community, to the private sector. Among the sanctions that are on the table to be lifted by this administration are not nuclear sanctions, they're terrorism sanctions. The Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company, its tanker company, its petrochemical company, all of these sanctions reportedly are on the table from envoys Rob Malley in Vienna today for potential lifting under any sort of nuclear arrangement. Those entities, those institutions, those banks are designated for U.S. sanctions today, not for its nuclear program, but for terrorism, for financing the IRGC. And they have now admitted in the Biden administration that even if they go ahead and find a way to lift those sanctions, it will not be because those institutions have ended their support for terrorism. It will be a political consideration for a nuclear concession of some kind. That's very important because if you are a compliance officer at a company or a bank and you're thinking about money laundering, you're thinking about terror finance, you're thinking about who you're getting in bed with, who you're doing business with, and what might happen to you down the line, no matter what Joe Biden and his Treasury Department says, you don't want any business with any company linked to the IRGC and terrorism. And if they're going to tell you, we absolutely know these institutions are tied to terrorism, but you can go ahead and do business with them anyways, run away, run away real fast. That's where we are today. I look forward to your questions. I know it sounds bleak, uh, but I think that, you know, with the right leadership, there's always a possibility to change direction and build a multilateral coalition of pressure on what is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Absolutely. A little bleak, but it's, it's great information to know. Uh, so thank you for speaking with us. First question we have in is from Steve. Uh, how do you explain the fact that Israel has not attempted a major attack against Iran's reactors over the years in light of its actions against Iraq and Syria? It's a great question. It opens up a lot of different answers. Uh, I will say that in general, uh, as we have seen, uh, the Israelis uh, have opted for more clandestine means of setting back uh, Iran's nuclear program over many years. Uh, we've seen cyber attacks, we've seen assassinations, uh, some low profile, some high profile like last year. Uh, we've seen explosions randomly at facilities. Uh, and nobody knows exactly what, what or why, but we assume perhaps uh, Israeli involvement. Uh, we've seen them penetrate very deep inside uh, the Iranian apparatus Obviously, uh, Iran has, you know, must just, you know, a lot of their leaders must go to bed with tinfoil hats on uh, because, you know, if the Israeli Mossad can go into somewhere near Tehran and pull out from a facility overnight uh, all kinds of documents and archives, um, you know, the idea that, that they are penetrated so deep uh, is pretty clear. And so whether it is based on their intelligence analysis of how much time they have, versus the political risk, the military risk of engaging in direct military conflict, I think uh, has usually ended their result uh, of opting for these clandestine means of buying additional time. Ultimately, at some point, they will have to take action if the United States does not. And there is some red line, they've never announced it to us, but clearly in Jerusalem, some red line exists for military action. We've seen now more publicly than discussed the military option being back on the table. We saw even Foreign Minister Lapid talk about that in his uh, stand up next to Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, when he visited. We've seen reports that the new budget that the Israelis have adopted includes money to prepare an exercise for the military option on Iran. That's a lot of saber rattling, which is unusual for the Israelis. Uh, typically, they're a show, don't tell military. Uh, this is a lot of tell without showing. 
So you sort of wonder whether this is posturing more than actual preparations for a military strike. Uh, at the same time, though, I think the Iranians have to be aware that the Abraham Accords have changed the dynamic of the region. No longer is this the idea of an Israeli strike that can go on for days and needing to find air-to-air -air refueling capabilities and how many times of a strike would you have? How many sorties could you take out? Because of you know, having to go the distance and back, this is not uh, as simple as the Iraq mission of one site or the Syria mission of one site. These are multiple sites. There's advanced air defense uh, in Iran. Uh, but with Abraham Accords, uh, there is a real possibility that the Israelis could be using secret uh, desert runways uh, very close to Iran uh, with fuel depots to land quickly, refuel, and take uh, back off into the air. Um, it is possible that various other advances have been taken. If I'm the Iranians, I also wonder if you know so much about our nuclear program, maybe you have the schematics to our facilities too. You know exactly where to hit us. Uh, so that uh, big mountains collapse in uh, and, uh, and, you know, cavernous uh, nuclear facilities uh, collapse from within. So I think the Iranians have to take it seriously. And I think we should assume there is some red line for the Israelis. What that is, obviously, uh, is not known to us. Thank you so much. And if I'm remembering correctly, back in 2018 at the UN conference, speaking of the warehouses, uh, it didn't seem like the world believed Israel or would do anything. Do you think that if more information such as that were to come to light, uh, would the U, uh, EU and US help out? Well, listen, I, I think it is imperative for us to make a distinction between the JCPOA and the expanded enrichment uh, that we've seen out of Iran, which is part of its counter pressure strategy to see how far it can startle the international community, try to use that as an extortion technique to get paid not to enrich uranium, versus what they don't show us, what they're afraid of us finding out about, what they're hiding and concealing. And that's a separate track. It's a much more dangerous track that we are losing sight of under this administration. And so, yes, when we go into the board meetings, you, you can you can say, oh, you know, we hope we go back to the JCPOA. I don't, I don't want to go back to the JCPOA, but the Biden administration could say that. But they could very easily say, but by the way, the NPT has nothing to do with JCPOA. This is an underlying obligation, treaty obligation of Iran. And we need to get to the bottom of these undeclared sites and this undeclared nuclear material, no matter what goes on in Vienna. Oh, and by the way, another policy that would make a lot of sense, we're not going to lift any sanctions. We're not going to do any nuclear deal until we have a resolution to the underlying nuclear deceit question. We cannot build a verification regime for any nuclear agreement with this regime unless we know the full extent of their nuclear activities. And so it, it, it just sort of undercuts the logic of having a nuclear negotiation while you know they're concealing clandestine nuclear activities. It makes zero sense. Great point. Um, from George Jacoby. Could a successful JCPOA be translated into a comprehensive Mideast nuclear free zone as called for in the NPT review conference and enforced by IAEA and including the course, of course, Israeli nuclear weapons? Yeah, listen, I don't think there will ever be a, um, a Mideast uh, nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, I think that it's uh, construction and the conception of that uh, was used uh, long ago, unfortunately, by Arab countries uh, that were looking for ways uh, to bludgeon Israel in the international arena to make Israel the issue, to make uh, the perceived threat of Israeli nuclear weapons uh, the greatest threat to the Middle East. What we have seen now is uh, the region has changed a lot over the last several years. And in fact, uh, Sunni Arab countries in the Middle East are not afraid uh, of Israel. They don't believe that Israeli nuclear weapons uh, are a great threat to international peace and security. They are very afraid of an Iranian nuclear weapon ever emerging. Uh, and that is why they have all opposed in unison uh, the JCPOA and any return to JCPOA. Uh, what I do think we could have uh, is an acceptance uh, throughout the region of the Middle East state uh, of a zero enrichment policy uh, on, on their soils. Um, we could see uh, in exchange for Iran agreeing to have no enrichment uh, on its soil. We've already seen the UAE adopt gold standard uh, for its own civil nuclear program. 
We could have the Saudis make a similar commitment. We could have other countries in the region make a commitment as well. If you wanna have peaceful civil nuclear energy, you do not have to enrich uh, on your own soil. Uh, and we should try to promote that as the standard. The JCPOA is very dangerous for that and actually uh, perverse in rolling back our non-proliferation standards for all other countries, including like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, by allowing and encouraging enrichment uh, on Iranian soil. That is very dangerous. Uh, if you are a non-proliferation promoter, um, it makes no sense to support JCPOA uh, by encouraging and, and providing legal approval for enrichment on Iranian soil. Uh, I also think it's notable that we've never expanded that regional uh, picture to include Pakistan uh, in that conversation. Uh, I think suddenly those who are pushing at the UN for the Middle East uh, uh, nuclear weapon free zone uh, by bringing Pakistan into the mix would suddenly say, well, that's a different region, a different conference. Uh, we, we, we can't continue the conversation. Uh, so it really just goes to show what, what the real purpose of that whole ploy is. Thank you so much. Uh, Mindy Stein asks, what can be done to convince China that it is not in their best interest to block efforts to isolate Iran? Uh, I think it's difficult. Um, there was, uh, at some point, uh, in my view, uh, maybe a decade ago, uh, a way to communicate to uh, the Chinese leadership that uh, they depend on their economic growth uh, for a stable uh, import, a stable flow of energy uh, from the region. And so uh, as they obviously want uh, multiple suppliers of their energy, so they're not solely dependent on one country or the other, they also need to ensure that there is stability in the region to ensure that that energy flow continues. Uh, in Iran that is uh, pursuing nuclear weapons, in Iran that refuses to give up its enrichment program, in Iran that sponsors terrorism and uh, uh, conducts other malign activities, um, puts the entire region in jeopardy. In fact, we have seen uh, Iranian uh, attacks, uh, cruise missile attacks, UAV attacks, uh, proxy attacks carried out on Middle East energy infrastructure, uh, most notably in Saudi Arabia, on Saudi Aramco. Uh, we've seen attacks on tankers in the Gulf. Um, this is very destabilizing uh, for the uh, energy flow that China depends on. That would be one uh, very, very big uh, uh, argument to make to them, and it's one that we have made to them in the past. What we have seen, however, is a shift in Chinese strategy uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, where I, I really fear now that they see Iran uh, as a strategic uh, step in a broader Middle East dominance uh, strategy. We've seen them moving in throughout Africa. We've seen them uh, in Latin America, they have a Middle East strategy as well, and Iran is squarely in that. Um, and so uh, the potential for investment that they have pledged uh, to have a client state of their own uh, in the Middle East, the potential to make trouble for the United States, I think is increasingly uh, offset uh, by what is not in their interest, which is allowing Iran to move forward uh, with any sort of nuclear program uh, that could potentially grow to a nuclear weapons program. Uh, and also uh, any sort of um, sanctions relief uh, without uh, cessation of sponsorship of terrorism. Thank you. From Carl Goldberg, uh, for, um, let me rephrase this. Is it naive of Republicans to demand that Iran behave like a normal country? Uh, it, it, it's not naive. Um, it is uh, something that is, uh, very smart to say out loud, uh, because when they do not act like a normal nation, uh, it justifies why we do not treat them uh, like a normal nation. Uh, and so that is the reason why uh, we say these things. Uh, the 12 uh, demands we recall from Secretary Pompeo in the Max Pressure campaign, um, many on the left uh, started decrying it as fantastical. These are outrageous demands. You will never get this to happen. This is a fantasy, which is why we need to cut uh, the JCPOA as the deal that we have with Iran, because it's the best we can get. And that's what we should be negotiating. Uh, I think when we uh, fall into those traps uh, that the left sets, uh, it's a mistake uh, because uh, regular people in America, regular people in, in allied countries, Understands what understand what it means when you when you speak plainly about how normal countries act. 
and you describe the behavior of this regime in the nuclear realm, in the missile realm, uh, in the terrorism realm, in human rights, et cetera, um, that's not normal. Uh, and we should demand normal behavior if, we, if they are trying to extract from us normalized economic relations, if not normalized diplomatic relations. And so I think that's the core uh, of that messaging that you hear. It's not that anybody is under a delusion that the Islamic Republic um, you know, is, is some sort of uh, nice uh, possible of, of internal reform uh, regime that, you know, just you know, going to wake up one day and say, yeah, we, this Islamic revolution thing, it's just, you know, that was just all fake. That was all phony. We were just, you know, it's all propaganda. I think there are elements of people perhaps in the regime who believe that. I think at the mid-level, the decay, the bankruptcy of the ideology is pretty widespread. Uh, but I think we're not under any illusions on the elite uh, and in the regime officials, uh, their commitment to the Islamic Republic. Which is why in the end, no matter what course we choose, I think the fate of the Islamic Republic is going to be that of the Soviet Union, where it ends up in the dustbin of history from within, uh, due to not just bankrupt economy, but a bankrupt ideology. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have quite a few questions that are uh, unfortunately have to be left unanswered at this time. But do you have any key takeaway points you'd like our viewers to know before we go? I would just reemphasize we're at a key decision point uh, for the Biden administration. We're nine, 10 months almost in a very failed policy of maximum deference after abandoning maximum pressure. The Iranians feel very emboldened. They're driving this negotiation. They're driving the offense in the region. They're driving their nuclear program forward. And we have a decision point coming up at the IAEA board meeting this month. We should go forward with a censure resolution no matter what the plan is in Vienna. Quite frankly, it would empower diplomacy to go forward and center Iran. And we should not lose sight of the underlying problem of this undeclared nuclear material investigation uh, and not let it distract us from cutting some bad uh, nuclear deal, something that could be even worse than the JCPOA and, and keep laser focus on accountability and a full declaration of Iran's nuclear program. Wonderful, thank you. And real quick, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Absolutely. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Rich underscore Goldberg uh, and a lot of my work published on FDD.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Goldberg, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Of course. For our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar invitation coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.